Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglies Guitar Show. About four months ago, I talked about this guitar right here that was gifted to Jared James Nichols by a fan of his work, and Jared set out to restore this through the guitar community. So just in case you missed that episode, let's do a quick recap here. This thing was in a tornado not all that long ago in 2013. It basically took this guitar, threw it all the way up in the air, and they just found it in a heap of rubble, just as we see it right here. And when we're talking rubble, we're talking this. All of this on top of that Les Paul. Maybe it was under the car. Who knows? That was a huge tornado, and it pretty much destroyed the entire town. So naturally, it had to be nicknamed Dorothy. So they were missing one of the knobs. They were missing the entire neck. The back got all scratched up because who knows how many times this thing went up in the air, flew around, hit things, got scratched up against the cement. Pretty much all that was left of the neck was the heel cap. But this guy, having great taste in Les Paul's gecko burst over here, decided to gift it as is to Jared just like this. So I thought for today's video, we would go through the restoration process of this because it is done. Here it is. We'll go through the luthier's work later on, but I didn't want to drag this video out too long if you just wanted to see how it was finished. So, they decided to pay tribute to its original design right here, because this was one of the earliest 52 Les Pauls. Remember how we were just talking in this video? Unbound neck with the diagonal mounting screws for the bridge P90? But, those really early ones had trapeze-style bridges just like this one. In fact, if you look at the old photos where there was still dirt and everything on it, you could actually see the very brief outline of that. So they decided to keep it as original as possible and did the trapeze. And it looks like they swapped one of the non-original knobs to up here and then replaced it with like a modern day replacement or maybe it's a vintage correct part that just hasn't aged quite the same. I think it'd be a nice touch if Jared would just put two red knobs on here, you know, like Dorothy's shoes. <laughs> That'd be funny. But I was surprised and elated to see they did no touch-up work to this at all. They left it alone, they just cleaned it up. Now I'm sure it'll get dirtied up again on tour, but at least it's a little bit more in respectable condition. I'm sure there's lots of people that would have took this and converted it into a 59 burst because it'd be more profitable to do that. But this thing now has a story. So body aside, we've got a neck now, and that is a beautiful fretboard. It is a true Brazilian rosewood fretboard, but all the neck is completely brand new. But a lot of the parts that they used to recreate this guitar were vintage original parts from 52s. People like Joe Bonamassa gifted some stuff, and the Colton cases even went ahead and gave him a new case, so this thing that went through a tornado will never have to get destroyed again, and it'll tour the world. I'm not quite too sure how they pulled off the headstock on this one because that looks really good. So maybe somebody had a new old stock headstock veneer or somebody's just really good at making replicas of these. And on top of all that, it was aged to match the rest of the guitar. Fairly convincingly. But here it is sitting in that Carlton case. That thing is never going to get damaged again. But here's a good shot of the entire guitar together. I like the fretboard. It's unique. It's got a lot of red streakiness in it and some brown streaks. But at the same time, it, it's really eye-catching. Like, it steals the show from all the other stuff. And the inlays are looking pretty bright there. But I'm sure it'll only take Jared a couple of years to get that worn down into a more natural look and feel. But what really surprised me is the fact that they did no finish touch-up at all. Like, I wasn't expecting Jared to have anything done to the top of this guitar. But I was curious about the back. So this is how they left it. They just had to shim some additional wood in here, and then they sculpted this neck onto what was left of the original one right there. So you still have, you know, the heel of the original neck on there, whereas all the rest of this stuff is new. But this is just going to be a battle scar that's left for everyone to see. Even the back, they left all the scratches and gashes alone. But curiously enough, they aged the headstock, right? But they decided to leave the neck alone. I can understand that from a player's standpoint. Sometimes fake aging of a neck just doesn't feel right, so they just let this be. So it's going to feel and play like a brand new guitar, but look vintage. But it looks like they sourced period correct tuners on this, and then they did a little design right here. So apparently these are red rubies shaped into a tornado. I'm having a hard time seeing it from that photo. Maybe they're just really dull gemstones, or the lighting wasn't the best. But it is touching that they have something red on this guitar after the name being Dorothy. And maybe that's why we don't need two red knobs on here. <laughs> 
So that's the completed project, but I was kind of interested in some of the behind the scenes. So this is the guy who did his work, JW Restoration. You can find him on Instagram. Looks like he's got a reverb shop, but he's not currently accepting new work. So don't bug the guy. He was also the luthier who restored that Goodwill Les Paul special that was featured on another channel that we talked about in this episode. So let's see how this all started off. So he got the guitar just like this. He's like, okay, what are we going to do with it? The knobs have got some chips on it. We need to document every square inch of this to make sure people don't get upset with me because he's got the whole world watching him. Well, the whole guitar world anyways. I mean, these are some beautiful shots. You can really see the aging on the original Switch right here. But this is what he had to work with on the neck. The P90 cover's cracking because of the screw that was right there. I never even thought about that. That's probably why they switched to mounting them here. They were having issues with that, which totally makes sense in my eyes. Oh man, that one really got beat up. You couldn't see that from the regular angles. Like that got caught right there. Must've got hit down really hard. I'm surprised the plastic didn't splinter more than that. And this shot really shows you like, I was thinking those were just, like, scratches. I didn't realize they're really deep grooves. That's actually a lot rougher than I thought it would be. And the fact that the original neck broke right here makes me think that it hit something from the back of the headstock. So it got dinged, and that big force caused this to fracture right here, and then the rest of it left forward, and that's what caused the neck to splinter in this area. Okay. And then we just got another shot documenting the current condition. So the next day here, he's cleaned it up a little bit, it seems, but we've still got some mud on it. We can see some evidence of a trapeze tailpiece on here, as well as more gouges and chunks out of the body, and maybe even a crack along the side. But then when he takes the back control covers off, absolute time capsule, perfect. <laughs> Nobody's ever opened that thing up at all. And surprisingly, no dirt or dust or anything got into there. So that's kind of funny to see the calm before the storm. So next up here, he needs to fix the channel route for the neck. So he's routed out all the wood and he's adding some additional wood in here to make it a point that he can actually attach a new neck to it. Obviously you can't take the splintered mess and make it 100% perfect. You've got to add some new wood and it takes some skill in order to do this. And he also needed to repair some cracks around this area. So we had some scrap wood that just happened to look okay in these locations and he went to town fixing this. And then after shaping and sanding it, he glues it into place. And then we're left with this. So we've got a new neck channel right here that should be very easy to fit a new neck into. And we've also got new binding put in to replace the original pieces that were missing. So next they chose out the Brazilian rosewood fretboard on this one. And with a little help from the Beastie Boys, he creates a new neck. Now I'm not sure where this neck came from, if it was a donor guitar or if it was just something he built himself, but he had to put the frets in and do all the work. So here's some good shots of where he crafted the old neck onto the new neck. And it looks like he actually took that piece of the neck off the entire guitar and then did it here before he set that into the body. All right, that makes sense. So yes, indeed, it does look like he crafted the neck himself through all these photos and matched it up the best he could. And here he's talking about why they decided not to do any aging to the neck except for the headstock. And then BAM! It's exactly as we know it now today. And then here we can see Jared playing it. So what's kind of interesting about this is back in the 50s and 60s, there were so many mythical guitars that had stories behind them that they're now reissuing today. You know, pieces like the Rocky Strat, the Rosewood Telecaster, the Fool SG, Peter Frampton's Les Paul Custom. They have that lore and history behind them. Is that what this is in the modern day unfolding? Will we one day see a custom shop relic reissue of this exact guitar? I could see it happening because Jared has a whole Epiphone lineup that I'm sure is going to keep growing. He just became a Gibson endorsed artist as well. So I'm sure we'll see a Gibson Les Paul with his name in the future. 
And I think a great place to start would be one of these guys. Because he's got Dorothy now, he's got Old Red, he's got his original Old Glory. All of his guitars have a story behind it, and I think that's really helping him become more well-known further outside of just his guitar playing skills. Because in order to make it in the industry, you need something special. He's got the playing skills, but his guitars are starting to take on their own personas, they have their own stories, which gets, you know, the internet guitar people all in a ruffle. They love tales like these, so I think it's really cool that Jared is piecing together all these really nice 50s pieces that have good stories. And I think now is as good of a time as any to tell you guys, we very well might be documenting our own story about a 50s Les Paul that met an unfortunate fate and then got restored, as a viewer of the show has offered to send his in to me. But that's all I'm going to say for now because it hasn't been shipped yet, so I don't even know if it'll ever make it here. But if things all go according to plan, we'll have a really cool one to check out in a couple of weeks. But since we've got some time left today, some traditional guitar hunting. What do we got here? Nighthawk Hardshell Case. Those are kind of hard to find when you need one. Unfortunately, I don't need one right now. Do you guys remember when I had one of these back in Trade Tuesday? I think that's about what I tried selling mine for. Somebody will buy that if they need it. Continuing on here. Whoa, that's not a bad price. So the Les Paul Custom Lights. There was a very small run that had the Floyd Rose built into it, and you don't see these things hardly ever. So the fact that this one is also in the Sunset Metallic, I'm not normally a Floyd Rose guy, but this, this is one of those guitars that needs it. It's like the precursor to the Les Paul Access. Man, this is from a reputable dealer too, Rumble Seat Music, only $41.50? That's a steal. Well, maybe not a steal, but a good deal. I could see it selling for as much as 5,500. I mean, look, you got the stop bar variety for 5,200, but people like Floyd's more than Kaler's usually. <sighs> That's tempting. I've only ever seen like two of these in Sunburst. I think I'm going to uh, contact the store <laughs> slightly after this video, make them an offer on that. If I don't get it, somebody else should buy it. Then we've got a couple of customs here. They're starting to put out Silver Burst Les Paul customs for like 4700 bucks, which just seems like a steal anymore. The brand new ones tend to sell very quickly once they get listed. It just takes Gibson a long time to push these out. I don't know if I like that headstock. Like, ew, that's disgusting. It's supposed to be black up there. Why is the burst so big? <laughs> Ew, I don't like that in the slightest. Gibson, please change that back to the traditional small burst on the side. Ugh, no. Maybe that's why it hasn't sold. That's the first time I've seen that. But then listed right beside it is this 2003 for more money. But what's cool about this, this is the first time when Gibson actually started bringing Silver Burst back. I believe it was a, a dealer exclusive for a time. But when first reissued, the backs were black, just like the original Silver Burst prototype. Generally, people don't seem to like the non-bursted versions as much as the ones that do have the burst on the side, back, and neck. But it is an interesting part of history, and if you're a silver burst collector, you definitely need a black back in your collection. Something else for silver burst collectors are bursted back of the headstock and non-bursted. So the vintage ones, a lot of the Kalamazoo made ones, will actually have a black back of the headstock instead of having a burst. Some of them have it, some of them don't. Sometimes Nashville's don't. It's It, it was just like a builder's choice at that point in time. So Troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed tonight's episode of Jared's Restored Dorothy Guitar. If you're interested in other JJN videos, you can check out my Epiphone reviews, his new Gold Glory, or you can check out this prediction episode where we try to figure out what will his next Gibson signature guitar be. There were a lot of fun play on words in that episode, as well as some cool finish ideas. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll catch you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.